and how do you keep alive this pleasure principle for me was the point. So it's not speed because I don't know if this is very kosher to say, but I mean, you can think of other parts of your life where if speed was the main objective, it wouldn't be very much fun, would it? So... What you, can you expand on that? <laughs> no. Please join me in welcoming Mark Schatzker, Amy Rosen, and Laura Calder. Uh, I think food is everybody's favorite subject. Um, if you consider the human genome, there is more instructions taken up, taken up writing the code for your flavor sensing equipment than any other part of your body. We are wired to eat. It's the most important evolutionary imperative. Feed yourself. You can't reproduce and keep the species continuing unless you've eaten. So food plays a central role in our lives. On a very simple level, we all want to eat. And that's why we buy books such as Amy and Laura have written. But food is such an interesting subject. To me, it's the most interesting subject because it, it represents the intersection of everything, not just what we want, but science, the world around us, the animals that we grow, the plants that we grow. Everything comes together in food. It is our most fundamental interaction with the world around us. So on the one hand, it's interesting to talk to Amy and Laura about recipes, what do I make? But on the other hand, I think these books are so interesting in part because what they tell us about ourselves, but what they tell us about how we can live better. Um, we live in an interesting time where food has actually become a problem. Um, obesity is essentially our biggest social issue, and we need a way out of that. And I'm, I believe that the way out of that is through better tasting food. Uh, that seems odd because we think that's the problem, but I think we have a lot to learn, uh, not just from food itself, but from other cultures. Um, so I want to start by asking a question which is that we come to books like this because we want to eat and we want our food to be delicious. But I'm curious about your own need. I'll start with Laura. Did you write this book because you felt a need to write it, to express it, or did you feel there was a need for it? Or was it both? Well, I was, the truth about this book, Paris Express, is that I, someone told me to write a book about cooking quick things in France, because that's the hot topic. How do I do it all? quickly. And this book took me longer than any other book to write. <laughs> and because what I came around to in the end, I thought that these, uh, it's not just France, but in France, I, I, I kept asking people, so give me a quick recipe. And they'd say, oh, this one's it's such a piece of cake. You just put it on like four hours later, it's done. No problem. And I'd get any range of answers. And I just realized I'm trying to write about quick cooking and nobody here cares. They don't want it to be fast. It's not their main interest. And I know, and obviously, in France, everybody works the same schedules we do and all of that. But the food idea is that it should be pleasure. And so once you start cooking and you're, you have a glass of wine and you're standing around making something, you're already in the pleasure zone. And that's what people do at night. They eat. So I couldn't get the quick out of them. So then I had to make it, switch it around. So um, now then I forgot. it becomes quick prep. Yeah. But I, then four hours of cooking. And then four hours of eating. Yeah. But I think the main thing is that people want to, I forget what your question was now, because now I've gone off on this. <laughs> it was that good. It was uh, so good. No, it's, it, it's whether you felt um, that there was um, a need for this book from the audience, or you just wanted to express it. Well, what I, when you write a book, you, you start off you make a pitch and then the book turns out to be something other than what you thought it was going to be. Um, so maybe I needed it. But also I was moving back to Canada then. And how do you keep alive this pleasure principle for me was the point. So it's not speed because, I don't know if this is very kosher to say, but I mean, you can think of other parts of your life where if speed was the main objective, it wouldn't be very much fun, would it? <laughs> so what you, Can you expand on that? <laughs> no. Can you expand? Yeah, it's Friday um, night. But I disagree with that because if I'm developing recipes for a food and drink magazine or mm. a Chatelaine, I know that if it's going to take people too long, they're not going to make the recipe, and I want them to make the recipe. Well, sometimes I make quick things. Like the, I have a recipe in there for it's a cucumber and avocado soup. So you get the blender out, you throw in a cucumber, throw in an avocado, mm. and the pu that's great to get out of the way. But basically, if you like cooking, I just wonder why we always have to get it out of the way. Not even getting out of the so way, fast. but 
there's a lot of delicious dishes that don't have to take no, a long time. That's true. But I think the, the key thing for me, because I'm a guy who cooks, I do all the cooking in our household, mm -hmm. um, you have to want to do it. Um, the reason people turn to convenience food, they say it's because they're busy and they, they have no time. I think the real reason is they don't want to cook. Um, if you can mm -hmm. love cooking, yeah. it's something that you look forward to in your day. But this is part of the reason your books are so important, because you flip through them and you go, oh my god, I'm dying to cook that. And I that's... I want to make that, it yeah. get, it gets You start to drool. Mm -hmm. Everybody nodded. That makes me so depressed. What, yeah, we don't want to do it. What? You don't want it? This is Wait, not the night to be here. About? What, what was the nodding about? That you oh, don't about want to do not it wanting to cook. But I think the no. not wanting to cook is not wanting to be in a room that feels sterile and horrible. It's not wanting to be alone while everyone else is in another room having a good time and you're there slogging away, don't you think? When I mean, people say they don't cook or they don't know how to cook, it means it's not a priority. Because if you can read, you can cook. You're choosing not to cook. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's true. Or you can watch TV. You can, do, you can always do something else other than cook. It's only, cooking's only fun if, you're, if there are people to feed and it's fun. So I think you have to make it fun to do it. Well, I try to. I don't know. So here's an interesting question or maybe it's only interesting to me, but <laughs> the house I grew up in was, a, was one of those old Victorian homes, and the kitchen was very separate, because in the Victorian yeah. era, the more, the more rooms you had, uh, the more that was a, a, a testament to your status. So the kitchen was one of those, that's where the help, you know, mm -hmm. not in the house I grew up, but that's where the help was supposed <laughs> to be, and everyone else was out in the living room, the mm. food was brought to them in the dining room. But the way people design their homes now I mean, every time there's a party, the party migrates to the kitchen. Everybody always wants to be in the kitchen. So maybe, maybe that is a, a positive step in terms of, um, instead of being, you know, kind of shunting cooking mm -hmm. off, that's something that the staff do. It's, it's, it's the main event. I mean, there's restaurants now where the seating is organized around the kitchen because everyone wants to My dining in. room table is in my kitchen. There's no separation, which is not great during a dinner party because the dishes, and everyone get out and they have nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. but. It's, um, it's organic, like it's just, yeah. it happens, it's real. And but I also think we can't pretend that cooking isn't work, because it is. And I, I often say this because I always on TV people are saying, it's so easy to have a dinner party for eight people. And I think, I just spent all day going to the market and getting my mm -hmm. ingredients, and I spent a fortune on you, and I've cooked, and uh, now you're calling to say, you can't come, and I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> So, You're 45 minutes late. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I'll fill so in next true, time It's true. It's work and it costs <laughs> yeah, exactly. money. But I also think it's worth it. Or I, you know, I wouldn't do it. I do it because I love the bringing people together. I think even if, and also if more people would cook and entertain, mm -hmm. I mean, entertain. If people would eat together more, then you know I do it Monday. You do it Tuesday. I mean, we're not going to eat at everyone's house every night of the week. But at least it we could try. You know. <laughs> yeah. Let's at least try it for a week and see how it goes. How about once, or you invite me to your house and then I you come to my you. house, so okay. you get the work one night and I get it another. And but I you like know what? It. I enjoy it. I enjoy the shopping. I enjoy the cooking. I don't enjoy the cleaning. But that's that's for someone else to do. Yeah. You say I cook. But my that's, roommate was here, and she knew I, I always cooked, and she cleaned. She was a very good That's cleaner. why I cook, because yeah. I don't want to cook. Right? Yeah. But I think right. the, the quick and easy, I just wanted to say that, because I think that everyone says it's so quick and easy, and then every time someone comes to your house, I think they think it's so quick and easy, and it isn't. But some, uh, but, it, but doesn't, it can be. It, can it doesn't be. have to be that yeah, hard. It can, it can be, be, sort of, when you don't do the, stuff. I think the biggest, people, the biggest mistake most people make with dinner parties is, A, Never cook a dish you've never cooked before yeah. at a dinner party. That is the Agreed. biggest rookie Number error. One. Yeah. But B, cook something. The real reason your friends are there is to enjoy themselves. So you don't have to impress them with, with some incredibly ornate dish that takes hours and hours to make. I think they're just as happy to eat a, a great stew that you cooked the day before. Uh, what Tastes they really want to see is day. you exactly. um, have a nice glass of wine and have fun. I mean, if you're up for it, go for it. But don't feel, don't handcuff yourself by you know, attempting to run a marathon when you haven't been training for a marathon. Right. So your number one tip, no new recipes. My number one tip is buy too much wine. And then it's always going to be a great night. Yeah. I think spontaneity to is you. good too, because when you invite people for dinner, we've got onto the dinner topic now, but when you invite people, especially in Toronto, I find Paris is very spontaneous. People call you last minute and invite here. Mm. A month in advance. A month yeah. in advance. And then they go, oh, to drop the kids off. Very busy judo people. that night. Anyway. Yeah. So then people, after a month in advance, and the invitation's on the mantle, in the email mantle, <laughs> yeah. um, 
then everyone expects something big. But if you just sort of get at people at the last second, oh, or they just drop over, you can say, gee, I have nothing but this tin of sardines. And then suddenly you can put off this thing that's more casual and everyone's that much more grateful than they'd even be for something you spent a month doing. I'm starting to think that you're in a unique situation that people expect big things of you because you're you. They expect nothing of me. <laughs> you? They're oh, they're happy to get a sandwich and a salad. They expect even less of me. There you go. They expect a steak of you, which I'm sure is the best steak. Now I've got my friends trained. All right. Yeah, they know. They all help. All right. Well, you have the first dinner party. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So one thing I'm really curious to know for both of these books, um, I'll start with you, Amy. How? Tell me about the research. I mean, you got to do a hundred recipes in the city's best restaurants. Mm -hmm. That's. I mean, that's like a. Did you actually get paid for this? I did, and I just got the first royalty check, and since the book's almost sold out, someone's taking the summer off. Let's just, I'm just <laughs> kidding. I'm, I'm a very hard worker. Um, so what happened was I had written a story for Food Arts Magazine about what's happening in the Toronto restaurant scene. And um, a publisher contacted me, and he said, I have this idea. They'd done it in Vancouver before with his previous publisher. He said, is, is the time right in Toronto for this? And I said, the time is exactly right. Ten years ago, this book couldn't have happened. But now, it's a collaborative community. It's exciting. It's one of the best food destinations in the world right now. And people would have laughed at that 20 years ago. I mean, in the 70s, it was a dry city, right? So um, then I thought, if I approach the, the, a few of the best chefs, and because of social media, if I'm like, wow, Grant signed on and Edula signed on, then the rest will sign on. And I had 50 chefs signed on within a week. It was, it was only going to work if they agreed to it, and they all agreed to it. And then um, it was a tight deadline, but they sent in their recipes. I said, send me the recipes, two per restaurant, that are true to you. And then that took another six months because chefs never send you the recipes, and it was a nightmare editing them. But besides that, Everything works great. Was there any great. overlap, though, where you have to say you can't do, you can't do this recipe? Cause I was worried. So I was, exactly, I was trying to be nice and say, just give me your recipes. And I knew there could be problems, too much overlap. There are a couple burgers, but people want both of those burger recipes. But there are two Thai restaurants, and they both handed in Pad Thai. So I said, uh, I got asked for it. So only one restaurant I had to ask an alt for. And did you get to eat all of these dishes at the restaurants? So I chose the restaurants I approached based on liking certain dishes. So we were talking about Edulis's Baba Ram. There are certain dishes I did ask for, or the P&L burger, and I didn't know if these restaurants would give up their signature, signature recipes, but they did. And then the most rewarding part of the book has been people Instagramming their recipes. And I, I write them back or texting me, I said, are you in the restaurant or did you make that? Like it looked exactly the same. And not just you know two or three of the easiest recipes, but I counted 85 recipes. So everyone was attracted to different recipes. And so they've executed them all. Was there one that you noticed was the most popular that people kind of gravitated to? No, that was the weird thing. I thought there would be, but no. That's always everything. the embarrassing thing. You write a cook, but there's always one rest some recipes you like better than others. Yeah. And yeah. I'm always amazed when someone says, look, I made your worst recipe in the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Picture. <laughs> I made your homemade ketchup. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how about Paris Express? How? How? What was the process? The research that brought that? Well, I originally wanted things to be fast, and that was a backfired. <laughs> but then I discovered what I discovered is, first of all, Paris is not. It's a. All the recipes aren't completely French. But Paris isn't completely French, and that's like here. And I realize what the stereotype we have of the place, or have had of the place, and it's really changed a lot. It's changed a lot since I was there because there was a real revival of classics, like bistro-y stuff when I was first there. It went away from the three-star things for a while. And now uh, all the chefs travel so much, and one, of the, one anyway, some of the hottest chefs in, um, one of the hottest chefs in Paris is an Australian. So the nerve. The nerve. <laughs> Who let him in? Uh, he's a brilliant cook. And an American. An American. Yeah. And there, you know, there are so other people cooking there, and it's changed the scene a lot. So it's, a bit, uh, it's interesting to go back. And it's, what I like about the French, they, I, they probably wouldn't like me to say this, but there's a certain femininity to the food. Uh, <laughs> that sounded so 
No, it's cliche. Delicate, delicate but beautiful. There, there's a, it's beautiful. Yeah. It's not like boy, boy food. Um, <laughs> like they know no one's going to play hockey afterwards, so there can be flower petals, and it's pretty. But anyway, it is getting more mixed, and maybe also though because chefs are traveling so much from here too. Maybe there's maybe it's becoming more generic. But was there? You spent a lot of time in France. Were there moments that you remember when you'd see someone whip something up that they kind of had an insight towards the the way they would cook or the way they think of ingredients that you found refreshing or inspiring? I think I think we were talking about this earlier, but I don't think that they the, they have the markets in Paris are amazing, and they're every corner. And even if they're not markets, the shops are amazing. And so I cook better in France because I can shop better. It's easy. You go downstairs and you buy the bread and you buy amazing vegetables and you buy fish and everything's fresh and you go up and cook it and you think, I'm a genius. But actually you're just a good shopper. And here it takes a lot longer. You have to go a lot further. And often the ingredients are hard to find. I don't know, we were talking about tomatoes earlier. I almost never buy tomatoes. I don't bother cooking with tomatoes here because I don't know where to get them. Um, the keys. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, no, that's an interesting <laughs> you know. point because uh, many years ago I interviewed Alain Ducasse, the famous French chef, and he said something that shocked me. Um, he said the hardest thing for a chef is to find good ingredients. I had always mm. thought that it was you know, making the absolute perfect thinnest mm. crepe or no. r uh, rolling out a pastry technique. or somehow making a fine sauce. I thought it was all about technique. Mm -hmm. Chefs are wizards, and I think this is a, a kind of a myth that food TV promotes because um, it's all about the pyrotechnics and mixing bizarre flavors and how hot mm -hmm. can you get your pan. And these things are on some level important, but Alain Ducasse said that's the easy part. It's getting good ingredients, mm -hmm. which we never think about. This is something I write about a lot in my book, which is that so much of the food we grow has gotten bland, but my belief is that if, if you have good ingredients, and maybe this is one reason people don't like cooking, it's actually way easier to cook when you have great ingredients. You can throw together a salad with three ingredients and a little bit of olive oil and a squeeze of lemon, and it's an amazing salad. It's also the shopping, though. When you're in a market that's really bursting and the displays are beautiful and all that, it makes you want to cook. But when you're in a grocery aisle, like, wow, mm -hmm. it's pretty depressing. So yeah. those are things that are, those are very challenging things. You know, it's easy to go to... Paris or somewhere in Italy and to cook wonderful food and think you're a genius and feel inspired. It's very hard when you're going to the local whatever the grocery store is and the, it's sterile and it's, yeah. It's like, what are you going to do with these cocoa pebbles? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and you're pushing this options. thing. Yeah. That's yeah. how you make the best steak. <laughs> exactly. Is that your secret? Yeah. But I do, I do, one of the things I do do, but I'm, I live now in the middle of the city and so I go to the market on foot. It's a lot of work, you know, here the bread, here the this, here the that, and I chat to the guys and so food, that's how I get my ingredients, so it helps and it's also social. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. not just me cooking, then you've already talked to everybody, so that helps. Sorry. Yeah. Um, I was just biking in Catalonia, not, you know, because I'm fancy. As one does. Yeah. But what um, amazing. <laughs> What amazed me was that you sit down for lunch or dinner, and right away it's pan au tomate. So mm. grilled bread, smushed tomato, sometimes garlic, and olive oil. And they just know every meal starts like that. Three ingredients. Mm. And it's the best thing you'll ever taste. But it helps that the bread is it's great. It's the ingredients. Yeah. It helps it's the just tomato has juice. It gives so you juicy, squishy. Yeah. You don't need a hammer or anything. Yeah. Here it's just skin. I know. <laughs> So It'll be fine. Yeah. You'll be okay. We'll all go. But there are ways to make, and also I care a lot about how uh, food is presented at home. I don't just stick things out, or I use, try to use nice dishes because I feel like you're, I think food is a highlight of the day, or dinner is at least. I don't have very many highlights before 6 p.m., but <laughs> I think the way you, you treat yourself, it's a kind of a self-respect thing. I think that it's, if you just slop something down in front of yourself, it's... You're not telling yourself it's not very loving. Make so it I, a celebration. I think you have to, yeah, make yourself feel good by doing these things because life takes a lot out of you. Uh, driving, says she, who just drove from New Brunswick. Um, <laughs> it's long and boring. 
Um, she would have biked. Yeah, I would have biked. It's what I do. It's and how she would have gone via yeah. Spain. <laughs> much more interesting. But um, I think we have to do so much in daily life that's very strenuous and hard and pretty depressing. And the landscape can be pretty depressing. Toronto is winter a lot of the year. A lot of the buildings are high and gray, and they're not green. And so if we don't um, try to, food's one of the best, it's kind of the closest to nature we can get, frankly, sometimes in a day. You know. Yeah, but a lot of the farmers markets are in the city parks, which I find wonderful. Yeah, I haven't like, found them yet. What? I'm Duffin thinking. Grove yeah, no, and I, Trinity I know Valley. they're there. Okay. This summer is my summer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so what about um, French food? Uh, for a long time, Paris was the undisputed world capital of gastronomy, and it's taken a beating. I mean, um, it moved to Spain, and then more recently it's moved to Scandinavia. And I've even heard chefs say disparaging things about France as a place to eat. I, I think a lot of that's overstated, um, and I think it's tempting you know, to put people down because it makes you feel better. But what, I think also, part, sometimes we get caught up in the, in the often silly question of who's got the best restaurant. But restaurant culture, and, and it's, it's often the best restaurant, the, so like there's one. Right, so who can you get one best restaurant if another city has 35 second best restaurants? Then wouldn't you rather eat there? But, that's but what I'm also curious about is math. the difference between um, we so often understand cuisine and culinary culture through restaurants. Restaurants are wonderful, but n restaurant cuisine is not always the same as home cuisine. So what is your perspective both on how you know, what French cuisine is today, but also how French cook in their homes. I think that restaurants are only as good as their customers because, I'll tell you something, a French chef, you know Pascal Barbeau, he has, uh, I forget the name of his restaurant now, Astrance. Anyway, this is a guy who is, has a three stars and he got his first star that fast when he went back to France. And he was from the middle of France, he went abroad, as many of them do, and he worked in Australia and he was the Mr. Number One in Sydney and very hot chef. And he came back to Paris and opened his place. No, no, no just quietly, what else is he going to do? No one knows who he is anymore because he left. And then he got a star really quickly. And I said, oh, why did you come back here? Because, you know, you were so hot in Sydney. And, and he said, I could cook anything. And they'd eat it. And they'd say it was brilliant. And I, it didn't, I'd never get good unless I came where the pressure was. And that is a different thing in Paris, where um, even you can eat very badly in Paris, like you can eat very badly anywhere, but you can also re eat really well, and the audience, the people eating, know the difference, and you just can't slide stuff under their noses. So but and why do they know that? Because, partly because home cooking is good, because the ingredients in the markets are good, people have good palates, and uh, it's part of the culture. It's part of the culture, and so they know. So you just can't say, this is the best whatever it is in the world. Everyone will laugh at you. They know the difference. And I think, well, it's true. I think too often you can, um, I don't know, you can, you can slip a lot of things under people's noses. So even if you're, I don't know, I think the pressure is good for chefs, and I think it comes from people having good palates at, at home. It comes from eating well at home. Otherwise, how, what are you going to have for a palate? And you're talking about the service industry there as well, how it's, there's pride and universities, it's like four-year programs, and it's their career waiters, so the, um, the hospitality industry there just lends itself to just a finer experience. What I do mean, they get paid? Well, no, but that, it's interesting because, you were that. It, yes, service, um, a lot of restaurant and hospitality jobs here are seen as either a temporary mm -hmm. stop or as um, maybe a job for uh, new arrivals to Canada, but, but people don't tend to think of them as careers, and they don't, I don't see them taking the same pride. Um, it's interesting, when you look at the trajectory of a chef in North America, they want to get to the point where they can open three or five or maybe a hundred restaurants. They yeah. want to get rich. Yeah. Um, the idea of having one, maybe two restaurants and just managing them well and having a middle or upper middle class life. Everyone's shooting for the top. When I, I, I did some work in the States and chefs there would always talk about a new restaurant, not as a restaurant, they talk about it as a concept. And they yeah. say, yeah, we think mm -hmm. this is a great concept and we can scale it. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're essentially chasing the McDonald's model. They want to have, if they really hit it big, they'll open a thousand locations and they will be rich. That philosophy is incompatible with producing truly great food. Mm -hmm. It's a great way to make money, but it's not a great way to produce wonderful food. So on some level, I think it's also a, 
a question of ambition and where you want to be in life and what you want to do, truly. No one wants to do anything real and small. I mean, you gave Alain Ducasse as an example. Now, this is a guy who has great, I mean, he's the top big three-star restaurants in fancy hotels. And uh, the food is hard to fault. But sometimes I find there's soul missing in it. And I, I think that matters. And I think when you've just got people pumping out the same thing and you've repeated, you've done this restaurant, and then you've done this hotel, and you've done that one, after a while, you're a businessman. You're not a... And exactly to that point, last year I did a story for En Route on uh, celebrity chef burgers in Vegas. They've all opened up these burger joints from the top French chef to Bobby Flay and Gordon Ramsay, Michael Mina. They were all delicious, but... Not, the, not a lot of soul. What's lot most soul. interesting That's is in burger. Japan, um, it's considered improper to go to a chef's restaurant and for the chef not to be there. Mm. If you're going to a great mm. chef's restaurant, the whole point is for the chef to be there. But interestingly here, a friend of mine's a chef and he says, every time I see all these chefs tweeting about where they are, what they're telling me is they're not cooking mm -hmm. in their restaurant. So who's doing the cooking? Mm -hmm. um, That's a great point. But we don't think about that. It's more, anyway, perhaps we should. Um, mm. But on that note, Amy, you wrote, your book is interesting because it's about, it's a, it's a book for normal non-chefs, mm -hmm. but the recipes are from chefs. So there's also this interplay where the cooking that goes on in restaurants is influencing us, maybe more so than in Paris. Maybe our cooking tastes are influenced more by what the chefs are doing partly because we don't have as much of a tradition of our own to fall back on. And the chefs, I think, everywhere are the trendsetters in terms of flavor and um, technique and just what we're going to be eating. Otherwise, we'd just all be eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, I assume, and an apple. So, um, <laughs> so what I, when I was sending out the call for chefs, I said, I want this to be, I want your best recipes but I want the book to be a dog-eared, stained cookbook that home chefs will use and that they can execute your restaurant quality recipes, which was a way of, of also saying, don't give me your most complicated recipe, but give me your most delicious recipes. And for the most part, they did. Um, a restaurant at Four Seasons, Daniel Ballou, Tyler's Recipes, and at Bosque in Shangri-La. I was like, ah, oh, you jerks, like this is impossible. But you know, three days, and, but I said, there can be the range because there's the 10 minute recipe from someone else, the pud thai, let's say, and then this is a project and people want projects too. Or the momofuku, yeah. you know, uh, sprinkle cookie that also takes a little more work, but it's the best cookie you'll ever have. So there's the range and everything, I mean, someone made those, um, Daniel Balud recipes and the and the boss like these were the two recipes I'm like well no one's gonna make that and they made them and they sent me their pictures so they were guys of course because guys like the big projects and you know <laughs> it's but, true uh, it is but funny? I think there's a constant exchange and there should be between um, restaurant cooking and home cooking I'm a home cook I make the granny food mostly um, so that's like, I like that homey stuff. Like I what? don't, wow. I what, what did you make for dinner a week ago? I was, because uh, I knew you were my traveling parents, this week. So my yeah. mom made it. No. Do you like rice pudding with raisins? This is what I'm getting. Oh, is this where you're going? Yeah. I don't put the raisins in. Thank you. Oh. Like raisins. <laughs> um, I'm not going to stand up for raisins. I mean, I definitely awesome. cooked. I'm a, you're, you're, you're the raisin. Sultanas, no. Oh, don't even. No, I'm kidding. But I think that the chefs come in with techniques and new things, and those flavors trickle down, and they make home cooking more exciting. But very often you hear chefs saying that they have to go back and make that thing their mother made or do something mm -hmm. really basic like rice pudding mm -hmm. to remember that feeling mm -hmm. and taste, uh, the experience of it. And I think that's how food moves forward. It's not like chefs are driving everything, because they always have to go back. And they started, I mean, you don't, you're not two years old going, ooh, I think I'll get out my whatever. Immersion circulator. Whatever that is, I don't know. Um, I have fun. Yeah, I want my <laughs> applesauce in that. <laughs> anyway, uh, sous vide. Um, so I think that that exchange is important and that yeah. makes home cooks better, but it makes chefs better too. And I think the more we eat good food at home, 
the more pressure, more we expect from restaurants, and mm -hmm. the better restaurants are. And restaurants should be glad that we're critical, we. But the other thing <laughs> is that um, what we often forget is that chefs don't cook at home the way they cook at their restaurants. Um, a few years ago, you mentioned sous vide, but a few years ago, sous vide, which is uh, cooking food at a low temperature inside a, a sealed vacuum packed bag, was all the rage. It's all the food writers would talk about sous vide, sous vide. It's the ultimate. It's the best thing for everything. Every chef I interviewed that sous vide stuff in their restaurants, when I said, do you sous vide at home? They go, no. Why would I sous vide at home? I'll yeah. just braise it. Yeah. Um, it's great in a restaurant because you can get every, you know, 60 different portions, 90% cooked, and then you flash it mm -hmm. in a pan and it's ready to go. Uh, but no one needs to do this at home. And we sometimes forget that restaurant cuisine is a very different beast than home cooking. Or in a restaurant. A sous vide is a very fancy name for boiling a bag, I think. It is, it is, it is. I can always tell. And wasn't it outlawed in a it's lot like of a places? Like a trampoline. Didn't something yeah, there, happen? Yeah, because there's concerns about pathogens and whatnot. Yeah. Um, that's never gotten my way. But, um, <laughs> were there, I'm curious for both these books, um, were there recipes, I guess, Amy, I'll start with you, was there a recipe that you got and you thought, there's no way this is going to taste good, and then it did? I mean, because sometimes, you know, there's those recipes that you think, I'll never cook that, and you're... And you're I have to say no. They, I, my, it's like, wow, that's delicious. Everything's delicious. I, nothing turned me off. No, or even just seeing it for the first time, just to, to see the words on the page. Hmm, not there sure There are some that. flavor combinations yeah. that surprise me, I'd say, but then once you taste them... It works. See the whole sweet and salty, fatty, sour tart, whatever. It, no, I. And, and Laura, I, I mean, obviously, you put these recipes in because you thought they were great. But was there ever maybe one of these recipes the first time you experienced it? You thought. They all sounded. Some of them sounded too simple to be good. Like there's one recipe I'm thinking of where uh, a friend said you cut up apples into cores and you layer it with red onion. And he stuck foie gras in the middle, but you don't have to. I just put rosemary, or you can, or you don't have to. And you cover it for 15 minutes. It was, I just thought, mm. it was so gorgeous. Like the red, mm. green apple turned, I forget, yellow, and the red apple turned pink, green. and then the, <laughs> yeah. well, the <laughs> sorry, <laughs> the, the me and the Granny Smith, yeah. whatever. It turned, um, and then the, it, was, it's, it was so beautiful and so simple. Yeah, that sometimes I'd get something that just sounded. Well, it's like the movie Ratatouille, right? The, the mean restaurant critic. It was just the simple that took him back to his childhood. You know, boom, boom, boom. He's at his mother's. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. We all saw Ratatouille. It all goes back to Pixar. It does. <laughs> um, so on that note, are there recipes in both of these books that you would recommend to people that they might not be the first thing it occurs to people to cook, but this is the one you should definitely cook? You want an actual name? Well, I have, I have four or five things in particular that I go back to all the time. I'm not going to name them because everybody gets a different taste of things. But there's some things that you just think, if you're going to extract things and put it in your My Forever Recipes book, I have some that just definitely fit there. And they're so, actually, you win. They're so simple. They're the yes, ones that are really finally. Panicking. Yeah. I just know I can make that cake and... Yeah, I'm loved. Name one. Okay, there's a chocolate cake in there, which sounds so stupid. And everybody has chocolate cake recipes. You think you don't need another one, but you do. <laughs> I would so say if it, if it ain't chocolate, it ain't dessert. Okay. Yeah. But mine actually is the one you mentioned in the other room, the Baba Oram recipe from Edulis, which is also my favorite restaurant in the city. But that's, you love Edulis too. Yes, right? Yeah. absolutely. Um, so. But how would you, uh, you've made it. Yeah. So how did yours compare to the one there? They didn't lie. Like, they gave the real recipe. And it, and it wasn't, and you didn't need to be some pastry wizard. You just got to put the love into it. It's going to work out. It takes forever, but it Yeah, works. you got to soak, soak it, soak it, soak it. Um, it's really cheap, all that rum. Yeah. So between bubble rum and chocolate, who's going to... Bubba rum. I, well, I, yeah, sorry. it's weird. It's the one thing that would trump chocolate. But mine's done in 20 minutes and yours takes... Like a day and a half. It's not mine. I would never no, make a but recipe. It is a amazing. A that that, what's funny about Bapo Rum as well is that it's a very common, famous dessert in France, also in Italy. Mm -hmm. That's um, the best recipe I've ever had for Bapo Rum, I have to say. But we hardly ever see it here. For some reason, mm -hmm. creme brulee crossed the Atlantic and it's everywhere. But yeah. there's um, the two I think of in France, <laughs> Bapo Rum and Ile Flottante, you never see here. Mm -hmm. Why is that? 
Because bubble rum takes a Fun. day and a half. It's like for it takes forever, but it's worth it. And creme brulee anyone can make. But very it's not, easily. I don't think it's that easy to make creme brulee. Easy to make creme it creme frightens brulee. people. If you've made it, it's easy, but most people are frightened. In fact, I don't think many people make creme brulee at home. Who here, raise your hand, has made creme brulee? That's a lot of people. Isn't I don't it? believe them. Oh my god. <laughs> I can't believe that. It's so rude. It's delicious. Uh, okay, so They've all heard us talk. Um, we have a few minutes left, so I thought it would be interesting to open up the floor to questions from the audience. This someone. I think she's just in charge of the microphone. No, no, no. So do people go up to the mic to ask questions, or how does it work? Yes. Yeah. And others, feel free to get in line. I know you have lots of questions. Too many for one person, so I'll leave it short. Oops, speaking of short. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ms. Rosen for her recipe for kick-ass tofu. Oh, okay. I love it. I make it all the time. It's a wonderful quick lunch. The white cheat, I do put it on top of buckwheat noodles. It's very fast, right? It's very, very fast and thank easy. Thank you. Um, so thank you for that. And I thank have you. a question for Ms. Rosen and Ms. Calder. Neither of you have talked about, aside from, you know, it is important to cook. I cook every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's also important to cook seasonally mm -hmm. and to use good equipment. And wow. I want to know how both of you feel about those questions. Well, I, I use good equipment because I, I think in everything, I, I, I think there's a false idea that something cheap is cheap. It's never cheap. Like, how many pepper grinders mm -hmm. have you owned? <laughs> and one that works, yeah. So you can buy 10 $20 pepper grinders or you can buy one for whatever, 50 bucks, and you've saved yourself 50 bucks. So I think equipment's important, and ingredients are important. I mean, I have my mom's hand-me-down Cuisinart from the 80s that's cracked, but it still works great, and I don't think you can... Me too. Mine's like 20 years old. I'm going to say mine's 40 years old. Oh, no, well, I don't think they were invented 41 40 years, years, years old. Mine's 2,000 years old. <laughs> Um, but the utensil I use the most is my old wooden spoon. I don't think you need a lot of equipment. No. But I do believe in eating seasonally. That said, next week, I think, I have a rant coming out in the Globe about how I'm not a big fan of um, the springtime harvest. I don't like fiddleheads. What can I tell you? Because that's the only thing you can harvest in the spring. Exactly. Yeah. Ramps. And ramps. Ramps are great. But we're, we're ruining the ecosystem. No, we're not. That's a myth. There are so many They're ramps They're banned. You're not allowed to sell them in Quebec. I, can, I will take photos this weekend of acres upon acres of ramps. There's, there's lots there. Fine, but that's you're said, you the harvest them That's on you, whatever. But the one thing I would say, um, not that I'm as accomplished, is buy good knives. In fact, don't buy yes. that many, but yes. buy two, at least three. one, or, but two. Chefs and a pairing, I think. Yeah, and I, I'm partial knife. to the Japanese yeah. ones. Um, Ceramic? And fridges. My parents have a really high-end fridge, and I bought my fridge at the same time. Theirs has broken down three times. Mine has never broken down once. You don't need to spend a lot of money on a fridge. How do you know if it's a good one? Well, theirs is a sub-zero, and mine's like a, a cheapo. You can't open the sub-zero. That's the problem with it. Wow, this the, is the so get on room. the sub-zero. Yeah, you cannot open exactly. it. I know, exactly. It's like the latest diet, buy a sub-zero, because you can't get to the <laughs> yeah, food. Exactly. And I also, I had a, a really cheap immersion blender, and it broke, and then I bought a really good one, and it's not as good as the old one. So. And I have bought old stoves, because... I hate digital. Because mm. every time you're trying to cook something and you have to go, because some guy, sorry, in a, <clears throat> designing it thought, this is really cool. You can go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus, on, off, plus, plus. <laughs> By which time your Hollandaise is completely curdled and destroyed. Exactly. So I love the knob on, off. Or you want to turn it up a little bit? So I have, I'm not against. Yeah. Uh, going into those second-hand things down on Queen and saying, give me one of those things with rings that's like 100 years old. They so, also work in a blackout. Uh, that's true. I guess. They work in a true story. I, it's oh. now in one of my brother's garages, but my parents bought this. It was a Moffat Fie or Fiesta Moffat or Moffat Fiesta, a two-oven stove with the elements from 62. It still works, yeah. but just we run it our I would get that a million years before I'd buy some high-tech thing where you need a PhD in button pushing. 1962, perfect condition. I once I rented an apartment in Paris for a short-term P 
period. And this was before when induction was coming in. Um, and she had lots of pots in there, or whoever it was I was renting from. And I ate apples for like five days before she was in China, before I could get in touch with her, because I thought, your oven doesn't work. And she said, oh, you need to use this pan for that. Mm -hmm. Induction. Yeah, that went down really well. So that, anyway. I just want to say one other quick thing, uh, Ms. Calder. I want to thank you for my boyfriend. One of the first meals I cooked, I cooked something. There was a strawberry sorbet recipe that you had posted online. And, or a strawberry ice cream recipe that you had posted on online. And he said it was wonderful. I also cooked him a really wonderful steak from Sanigans. And he said <laughs> it was that meal that made him decide that. You were the woman. Ooh, I was the woman. Good. <laughs> Sealed so, the deal. Nice. Yes. So, that's great. So thank you for that. You're welcome. I think that strawberry sorbet was Jennifer McLoggins, by was. the way. So you really. I actually, I also sent her a thank you email and she <laughs> responded. But you were the one that led me in the right direction. First. Oh, okay. There you go. Thank you. It was love at first bite. I'm interested in your thoughts about restaurant ratings. Mm. Anywhere from stars in the local press to who are you? Trokes are you? in Gomio or okay. Ros Rosettes okay. in Michelin and the power of an individual writer mm -hmm. or a restaurant magazine to rate restaurants with uh, some designated rating scheme, stars, rosettes. Yeah, go ahead. So I personally am against it all. Um, I guess it's almost 15 years ago, I started En Route's Best New Restaurants in Canada feature or survey. They just said, eat across Canada and tell us what you think. So there was a top 10 list, but it's positive because we were, we were and are informing people of the best restaurants you might not have heard of that are new this year. Um, and they're all positive stories. I was at one point going to be a restaurant critic, but I couldn't deal with people's money and lives um, hanging in the balance based on one person's thoughts for one to three meals and my personal taste. So um, I think people love restaurant reviews and critiques and that's how they plan their nights and it's, it's useful, uh, but it's just not something that I would do. I don't know how you... I use them because I also know some people in the business, so I ask mm -hmm. people whose palates I know. What I'm against is anybody and everyone giving, I think that's useless reviews on internet. It's completely like useless. Like, this place was amazing. <clears throat> Who are you? What do you know? I, I mean, you, you just, you, you, people don't have a reference point. You don't know who you're listening to. So whose review are you getting? People ask me, what's a great restaurant to go to? And I don't give any advice because I don't know what you want. or I don't know what you like. So mm -hmm. I'm a useless reference. But I have certain people who I read. I think if Michelin says a place is worth going to, it's probably right. I don't know if they've changed themselves. They used to be very, that shifted, I mean, because they didn't used to review places that could be like a great taco place would never make Michelin. Does it now? I don't no. know. I don't think so. No. I don't know if they've changed. But the thing, the thing about Michelin is they send their reviewers in um, anonymously and more than once. Yeah. Um, and they're also generally doing a kind of, a certain style of food. Yeah. Um, the issue I have with restaurant critics is that um, the anonymity is, in one sense, the consumer's friend, but on another sense, is the enemy. I've eaten with restaurant critics, and they're sitting there identifying the flavors in the food, and they're going, oh, there's cumin, there's this and that. There are scientific studies that show that this is basically impossible. It's, mm. it's almost, it's very difficult for anyone to taste a dish they've never tasted and say, this is how the chef made it. Um, I find food writing is most interesting when you get into the mind of the chef. Why did they make it? Maybe it reminds them of something they ate as a child. Um, and very often, we're not ready for things that are truly brilliant and powerful. Uh, the best play I ever saw was a production of Waiting for Godot uh, about 15 years ago at the World Stage Festival in Toronto. And for three days, I hated it. And it wasn't until it really sunk in that it, it, it totally altered the way. It, it, it had this unbelievable impact on me. And I thought, well, thank God I didn't review it in the second day. That's true. Um, but it's That's the true. same. And one of the, the tricks, we, we are all also subjective creatures. Um, I like reading David Denby in The New Yorker about movies. Um, he wrote a pretty bad review of the Grand Budapest Hotel, so I didn't see it in the theater. Mm -hmm. I then watched it on Netflix, and it's 
probably, for me, the best movie of the last five years, David Denby got it wrong. Now, he's not a bad person, but um, it's very difficult to find people whose taste overlaps so completely with mm -hmm. yours. So very often, I'd rather people say, this is what they're doing, rather than, do I like it? But it's not just a question of taste. I mean, a lot of people have a lot of, I mean, the big selling things in the world, the big Hollywood movies, those are the ones that sell, and that's what's most people's taste. I want to be educated, so I would look to also restaurant reviewers or movie reviewers or book reviewers, even if I don't agree with them all the time, I assume a book reviewer has read a lot of books and can tell me something. I think when you're reading restaurant guides, much of the time you can know that those reviewers, so-called, are students on their summer break eating for free, or eating, or not for free even, or sometimes not even going into these places, and I know this because I've written them myself. Just looking at the menus. You look at the menu, standing outside the restaurant, you write the review, and you... It's true. That's how a lot of these uh, travel guide things are written. So you have to get a good guidebook, or you go, you know people you trust. Like in Paris, I don't know, David Leibovitz or Alexander Lebron or two people I know there, for example. So I see, when someone says, where do I go? I give them their websites and say, see what those, they're eating out every day, they know. And I think, you know, you have to trust when people, you know, if someone goes to opera every night of the week, they're going to know this was a good production and this one wasn't. Or this was less so. Maybe it's their personal opinion, but it's better than having your five-year-old go and say, I didn't like it. I, I, I agree, but I also don't disagree, just because in some cases, the, like the Metacritic type stuff of, of crowd reviewing, it can be pretty good. I think sometimes the critics have gotten it grievously wrong. Maybe. I um, don't know. I just... Because there's strength in numbers, so let's say you want to book a hotel, you check Travelocity, and if everyone's saying this place has cockroaches and it's awful, you're not going to, you know, you yeah. see a commonality of certain things. I don't get out enough, obviously. <laughs> it's a tough one, though. I, I, yeah. It's, I mean, I say that. I also do read them, so I'm a hypocrite. I think yeah. you have to go, like, find who you trust. For sure, find who you And when you've it. gone to a few places and you think, yes, I agree with what they said, then I go back to them. But I think, generally speaking, just the massive internet, oh, five star, three star, two stars, it eventually means... But do the stars mean something to you? Or is it more the, wor the written words carry more weight? Well, you know, I have to say it's very compelling when you see a rating, which is something so simple or simplistic as uh, three rosettes in Michelin. Mm -hmm which also means very expensive, usually, but then you look at what is involved in producing a restaurant and mm -hmm. putting food on the plate and all the levels of service. Uh, but then, frankly, um, I read the text and try to read between the lines of the text mm -hmm. because it is one person's or perhaps several people's opinions and the sound of the dishes and, you know, I don't know, there's something amorphous. <clears throat> about a restaurant that comes through despite the ratings. That's true. Um, you probably noticed on blogs that um, you're seeing photographs of, of dishes that people are taking surreptitiously or not and, and posting them. That's kind of interesting to see what the dishes look like. Mm -hmm. That's true. Yeah, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you. thank you. Okay, so we have time for one more quick question and then we will wrap things up. I have a question for Laura. I'm wondering if you'll be doing any more cooking shows and what happened to all the simple dishes or cooking shows like yours that used to be on the Food Network? Yeah, it's all competition oh, well, now. it's not just me. <laughs> yes. um, I, I, I chose to lie low um, during the competition thing. I did one briefly and quite honestly, I didn't like doing it. I felt like it was fake. And I, I, I really don't like the competition shows. Um, because I also don't feel that way about food. I don't think it's a competition. I don't think it's about being stressed. I don't think it's about Gordon Ramsay yelling at you. Um, I guess they're entertaining, but I don't, that's not how I feel. <laughs> Thanks. But, I, so, and I, but basically, no, uh, I don't know that I would want to do another cooking show. I mean, I think things have their time. Probably there do need to be more mix and stir, because people, that's what we call them, mix and stir, the cooking oh, like shows. That. But I, I think people uh, like them. I don't know that I would want to do another one of those, but I definitely don't want to do the competition ones. And so the fact of the matter is, talking about mass taste, 
People watch the competition shows and they don't watch the cooking shows. They don't enough. So yes. that's why, and, and I think networks want to make this much. They don't want to make a show that makes money. They want to make this. And if it's not that, they're not going to bother at all. So it's cyclical, though. Everyone's going to get Maybe sick of Maybe it'll these come back. I don't know. Shows, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm not interested in that yelly, screamy posing like this. Okay, with, so with flames behind your so head. So fake. On that note, so, now you guys have to vote one of us off the stage. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, it's uh, always me. Uh, we're no. going to wrap up now, and there is some book signing happening at the back. So thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you, you both for okay. being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great night. Thanks. Thank you.